Attention, listener. I have an assignment for you. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to engage with the real nerds, a.k.a. the best podcast on the internet. You can listen to their episodes on their website, realnerdspodcast.com. And you can also listen to them on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and iTunes. Follow their social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This message will self-destruct never. This is Real Nerds Podcast, and for 10 years, we have been seeing a new movie every week and podcasting our experience to the world. I am Ryan. With me via Zoom is Brad. Hey. And Zach. And Zach. Hello. (laughs) Sorry, I had had something drop out. I'm good now. (laughs) And eventually we'll, we'll be joined by Corinne, evidently. Um, like I said, every week we see a new movie and we podcast our experience of the world for 10 years. We're two this... weeks away from our 500th episode, guys. I know. And I think there's going to be some um, heartbreak, Brad. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Uh, so I, I have this thing. For, so I have the printout, obviously. Um, for people that this is our first episode of listening to us. Uh, thank you um, for our fans that have listened to us for a long time. Thank you as well. Um, so how we're doing this 500th episode, we went back and forth on a lot of versions um, and we settled on one where it's like the Academy Awards, where there's a list of films and every nerd sent me a hundred, except for Corinne, she sent me 50. Um, and I was going to punish her. I was going to make her, uh, her films only count as half. But then I was like, oh, that's kind of mean. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, so if you're only going to do so, half the assignment, come on. I know. Like, exactly. It's your own fault. I agree. But I, I decided to be nice. So how it shakes down at your hundredth film is only worth one point. Your number one film is worth a hundred. And I took all six lists. Um, Brad, you and Zach sent them to me early. So I... I've had this thing half done for a while. And then the other list slowly trickled in. And as I was putting it together there, I've shared this with uh, Brad because Brad and I are putting something together for the episode, but um, out of 500 or so films, um, 271 were picked by the real nerds in their top 100. Wow, um, that's actually pretty narrow by like no it's not it's a pain in the ass because i had this huge um spreadsheet and uh because i don't pay for microsoft licensing i had to do it for my work computer so i would bring it home and i would do it and then i'd take you know my computer to work and so i finally got it all done it took me like 10 hours the night before I sent the list to Brad and he's like, Hey, you have a mo- movie on here twice. I'm like, fuck. I'm like, okay. So I went to my like list and said, okay, it's supposed to be this one. And he says, Oh, that's weird that this movie's not in there. And I went, fuck. So I had to go back and redo the whole list. And um, it kicked two movies off. Um, and there's some movies that uh, only one person picked. And those movies even if they're really high, did not make the list. So, oh, okay. Uh, it's it's really uh, crazy. And then, but then there'd be some movies that someone picked really high, and only one per other person picked, but it'd be like five or six points. But that would be enough to push it in the top one hundred. Um, huh. How I did the ties is I put the uh, the film that had the most nerds on the most nerds list above it. Um, so if there was four nerds and then three nerds, but it was tied, uh, the one with the four nerds was a higher ranked film. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so it was uh, quite the endeavor. 
And, and yet, and yet, Ryan, this sounds less complicated than the tier system at the Academy Awards itself. <laughs> yep. And, and also, uh, we're not a bunch of outdated, uh, aged voters in a system that's rigged. But anyway, keep going. Um, and depending on how many people we have, we also have trivia and games lined up. And one lucky person will be coming home, going home with my second copy of Raya and the Last Dragon that I forgot to cancel from the Disney movie club. <laughs> your, your prize is Ryan's leftover Amazon. <laughs> uh, not Amazon, uh, Disney movie club. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> that I forgot to log into. And I, um, so my, my phone, my bank app has this really unique tone. It's us bank. It goes, boom, boom, boom. and it was three o'clock in the morning and it went off a couple weeks ago. And I woke up I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I like, I think I got hacked and I looked and it said, it said Disney movie club. I'm like, what the fuck? So then I opened up my account and then I said, fuck. Um, and then Waltz so, goes, showed up and goes, you're fucked financially. So um, the name of that movie is waking up in the middle of the night, the fucking because I said fuck so many times. Oddly enough, Disney will be putting that out exclusively on Disney Plus this uh, October 14th. <laughs> yes. So They're our 500th fucking. episode happens in two weeks. Is the, um, is, this is, week, though, is, however, we is, saw... Is, sorry, Brad? Is the prize for the loser uh, still happening? Uh, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a secret one. Gotcha. The so Raya me. is just I won't say happening. what it is. R- Ryan, yeah. why don't you just give me the prize now? <laughs> Well, Zach is looking more and more. You might be the only other one on, so you might get both. Um, oh, woohoo! <laughs> yeah, we know all the answers, so you might I just can, win yeah. by default. I could both win and lose. <laughs> yes, it's just um, like regular life. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if the loser might really like their get uh, their prize, though. Brad, they might. They might. I mean, yeah, we'll it's, it's, it's a it's, it's a booby prize, right? It's not like a hurtful prize, right? <laughs> uh, well, it's no, COVID. It's the nuts from Brad. It's COVID. Um, <laughs> Just a syringe full of COVID. <laughs> yep, just a, just straight <laughs> injected. Ryan That's just sticks the real me with, variant. He just sticks me with the needle and I just go, why, Ryan? Why? <laughs> uh, so this week our film is Space Jam: A New Legacy. Stay tuned to the end of the episode where we will tell you if we recommend the film or not. Play the trailer and then spoil it. Um, we also talk yeah. about movie news, movies that are coming out on Blu-ray, movies and TV shows we've been watching. We do a lot of movie stuff because, uh, you know, the last uh, week or so, I, you know, you ever go through phases where you're saying, man, I don't know if I want to watch movies. And then you start getting into watching movies again and you're having a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. That's where I was this last week. Um, so, yeah, we just love movies. It's part of my yeah. life, part of what I do. We do, and we like, and we like watching them safely. Which, by the way, in spite of the COVID jokes, get vaccinated and keep fucking safe, people. Yes, I've just been waiting for some consistency in the in the screenings because I go out and see what I want, and already I've seen most everything within a week, and then you know I'm left wanting. So I'm hoping that yeah, hopefully flow uh, will come. Yeah, I, I think they're still. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> October is getting pretty full, which is looks, looks pretty great. So October's the yeah. best month in movie history since 2019 or 2007. One of the two. So, yeah, I think we'll have um, to do a film explosion um, in August, probably because. Yeah, yeah well, we're going to have to do one soon because we're going to if we don't, they're going to start being really smushed together. Yeah. Is it 2001 this time then? Yep. Yep. Ooh. We better all have the same number one, or we're all jerks. Mm, we'll see. Maybe. Maybe. So everyone has the Royal Tenenbaums. <laughs> uh, well, okay, Ryan. Uh, I think we can kick Brad out of the club right now. Nine <laughs> Eleven, the movie. Like what? I don't. Oh fuck! <laughs> oh wow! That that. First of all, <laughs> where where do what, you want to start minute, with your been answer? Twenty years. It's funny. <laughs> What's the big movie that you're all so passionate about? It has it has to do with a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, s- smaller people teaming up with some middle sized people and tall people to destroy a certain circular object in a fucking mountain of fire. 
The Wizard of Oz? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great if The Wizard of Oz was that. <laughs> no, no. Lord of the Rings, Fellowship Stupid of the Hobbits is. Fifth and last Hobbits is. You do a little too well, Zach. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Anyways, it's precious. Andy Circus, also, uh... watch your back. <laughs> we also go around town with Brad as he tells us the maybe more peculiar movie stuff that's happening around town. Hey, film buddies. Follow me around Denver. Yeah, at the drive-in, the let's let's do the eighty-eight one. The eighty-eight drive-in. Their lineup is currently the Boss Baby Two, Escape Room Two, Tournament of Champions, and F Nine. Boo. <laughs> and the Holiday Twin on screen one has Black Widow and F Nine, and screen mm-hmm. two has Space Jam: A New Legacy and Boss Baby Two. So. When I saw a preview for Escape Room one, I didn't know there was a first Escape Room. How the hell did I miss that? Yeah, wow. And, t- and two, it seems like it's a teenage version of Saw. Well, that's what the first one's supposed to be, but apparently the first one's actually kind of fun from what I've heard. Sure. Yeah. We'll go with that. Yeah, none of us saw it. We don't know. Yep. But, but you know what? Well maybe enough to get a good. sequel. Maybe it's good. If I don't I'm sure it's streaming somewhere. If it's streaming for free, maybe I'll check it out. If the world shuts down again, we will we will review the first escape room. It will not shut down again, Zach. Okay. Then we will never review the first escape room. <laughs> it's really holodeck the movie. There's, it, it's very futuristic. <laughs> but they don't have Moriarty in that trailer, so why do I care? Um, yeah, what? I'm missing all the retro screenings. Oh, uh, oh, the Dragons had Ryan. You don't know Moriarty's on the holodeck in TNG. This is what happens when you miss out on Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, Ryan didn't watch the show. Yeah, am I missing? No, it's it. You're if anything, you you would stand to gain a lot by watching it. So instead of being exclusionist, I will just well, say, I come on like this journey. The, with um, us. If there's the, a Star uh, Trek books that are coming out, look really nice. So maybe. Well, okay. If there's a Star Trek series, you should watch. It's next gen. Agreed. Um, I like TOS, but you should definitely just go for next gen. It, yeah. it gets you involved. TOS is classic, but seasons two and three, like three, really drops off the like interest level. Like and and you basically get TOS in those six movies, so you're fine without going through the uh, the, fir- the those three seasons. Yeah, it's good but, though; it's fun, but you don't have to. And Next Gen takes a lot of those stories and just makes them better. So, mm-hmm. but it's a seven season commitment. So, good luck with that. Uh, no, you know, maybe he's gone through shows before; he can do it again. Yeah. Well, they're hour long episodes, and they're more dramatic than. <laughs> the movies so all right ryan you have to choose between watching next gen or the blacklist <laughs> oh god clear winner. Not even a choice <laughs> there you go i solved this problem and made ryan watch star trek <laughs> i uh i found out this week that our friend kirstie Bryan is in this season of the blacklist nice yeah week. she does she's doing very well for herself she shows up in a lot of tv shows you may remember we promoted her for her uh, role in the in Hustlers a few years ago, and yeah, she's doing a lot of television. And it's funny that the show we malign so much is uh, <laughs> she's made an appearance in. So that's okay. You know, she needs to work. An algorithm is going to point her to one of our episodes talking about the blacklist and what she's and going I, to hear. And I'm sure she is wonderful in the blacklist because she is a wonderful person. So probably the best part of that episode. Uh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> There you go. Anyway, as I was saying, I'll watch the clip with her in it like I watched the clip of All Rise with her in it. Or the one with Huey Lewis in it. I can't believe Uh, that show, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's in a lot. Good for her. You know what her first appearance is, though, Brad? No. She's in one of your films. It's her first appearance, dude. Oh, my God. I did work with her before. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, she should definitely not have that on her portfolio. (laughs) Which which one was that for? I remember her running down the stairs. Bonsai Beer Cat. Bonsai Beer Cat. That's right. <laughs> oh man, I wish I remember that. I just like we just had this high school reunion this week, and I totally didn't bring it up. No, I oh, you should have. You made a movie called... put it on our IMDb page. <laughs> you made a bon- movie called Bonsai Beer Cat. Yeah. What's uh, the plot of this? Well, it's a commercial. It's not really a movie. Oh, okay. Big <laughs> commercial. Yeah. <clears throat> Still sounds like fun though. 
uh, yeah, two dudes are sitting in their basement, just bored out of their, their minds, and then they decide they just want to drink beer, so they open up a telephone book <laughs> to figure out where to buy. <laughs> this is 2001, <laughs> I think. Uh, and they find an ad for the Bonsai Beer Cat. They they uh, summon it, and it provides the beer, and just random women show up, and they start partying to Vega Boys, and uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and a bit mean to the uh, cat. You, I, I was also <laughs> thinking about our um crotch shot one we did oh championship crotch kicking <laughs> yeah because i love that carson because carson's been popping up in feeds too where it's uh he's like bitch ass motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> i like your uh there's no dialogue from you guys but you can see you mouthing no more balls no more balls because <laughs> you're the ref <laughs> yep yeah when, when we didn't care what was on the internet <laughs> we couldn't even put our videos on the internet when we were making those no, you, you I remember we had like a yet. watch party with um, Adam's parents and his parents' friends, and they were laughing, but I think they're a little um, shocked about how vulgar we were. <laughs> <laughs> As they should be. Yes. Yeah, I'm working on a Blu-ray of all those, and so um, privately we'll be able to enjoy those again. Some. Yeah, please don't release soon. those on the internet. <laughs> yeah. I They because they all had copyrighted music at the time. So the internet has since forced me to remove most of them. So, Oh, that's right. Yep. They can only Big be shared privately. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. The, the drive-ins uh, that's what's going on at the drive-in. Right on. Can, um, can I, we I, welcome. She's muted. Well, she's she's here, but she doesn't answer. Gotcha. Um, I would like to say there is something going on, not around Denver town, but in Boulder, the Dairy Arts Center has just reopened its doors and they're kicking back up their Friday night series, Friday Night Weird. This week they showed censors. This coming week, you will be able to see the movie Settlers, which is a cool little sci-fi flick coming out from Magnolia Pictures, I believe it is. So um, go up to the Dairy Arts Center and support their uh, wonderful organization there and kick back to a weird ass movie at 830 at night. Lots of fun. Cool. Uh, Corinne's testing a new mic too, so she. Oh, I haven't got it set it up uh, on my computer yet, so I don't think it's Wait, working. Wait, whoa, whoa! Let's stop for a second. You're gonna answer Brad when I said, "Hey, Corinne, welcome." You just fucking ignore me. Sorry, I was like taking a sip of my shake. You know what? I wasn't, no. I wasn't ready. No, mute, mute, mute. I'm not gonna mute now just because you told me to. <laughs> Oh wait, Corinne's supposed to mute. I don't have to mute. Not yeah, that. Zach, you're fine. Oh, I am. Oh, that this seems wrong. I'm muting myself again. Do it. This is my show. Everybody mute. <laughs> <laughs> so you Find just me. so you just want a silent audience to listen to you yammer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyways, Lovely. let's unspool some real news. It's real news. All right, guys. You excited for that new Blade movie? I think everybody's excited for a new Blade movie. We want a new Blade movie, right? Not really. Why? What what did the Blade do to you? I don't think I've ever seen the Blade movie, so I'm not invested. Oh, you should watch those first two and then leave the third one alone. Um, Well, actually, you know what? I take that back. Third one's fun on a goofy, absolutely terrible level, but it's still worth a watch. Anyway. Long story short, we're getting a Blade reboot from the MCU. Um, Hershaw Lee has already been uh, signed on to play the Daywalker. He's going to be great as Blade because he's a great actor. Yep. And now we've got a director, uh, Bassam Tariq, uh, who uh, recently did the Riz Ahmed film that's coming out called Mogul Mowgli. Uh, So, yeah, we've got our director now for the... It kind of seems like uh, Blade is the unannounced Marvel movie for 2023. I wouldn't be surprised if that is the actual case, but... Because I, my guess is Fantastic Four. I mean, if I was in charge of Marvel, I'd wait till 2024 and release it on April 4th. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what day April 4th is. That's just what I would do. Well, then that's what we're going to do then, Ryan. We're going to make sure they hire you to make these decisions going forward. I should be hired. Yep. Why not? Would be great. And then it'd be saying, Ryan, we don't need another Spider-Man movie. I'm like, it's been five months since the last one. And I'll be damned if I'll wait another five. <laughs> they, dra- they drag you out of the offices. <laughs> um, so, Ryan, uh, and 
Brad and Corinne, um, you're all bigger Office fans than I am. <clears throat> uh, but did you know that James Gandolfini was paid a bunch of money to not join the Office? I don't know if he's able yet. to spend that. This is this is before. So when Steve Carell left, they the 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 story is going around that before James Spader and after Steve Carell. They offered Jim, I want to say, four million to play him for the season, and HBO paid three million for him not to do it. Uh, this is Steve Sharipa talking to Ricky Gervais um, uh, during his podcast. So that's interesting. Uh, wh- I mean, I'm who assuming- didn't they try to get for that? <laughs> There's a whole episode where they have like seven or eight people competing for that job. Like it's it's almost like who didn't they get? Yeah, yeah. but uh, it's a uh, that that's interesting. I, I I actually would have liked to see that happen before uh, before Mr. Gandolfini's passing. But nevertheless, this is a nice little interesting tidbit of information that's coming out amidst the press for Many Saints of Newark, which is the Sopranos uh, prequel movie that's coming out from David Chase. So yeah, lots of interesting Gandolfini news abound. Um, so yeah, uh, and other another news, uh, we're getting a new TV show. Um, uh, from HBO and A24 called The Sympathizer, and it's going to star um, some gentleman who snapped his fingers back in 2019 and um, uh, changed the uh, an entire cinematic universe. What's what's his name? Um, Morton Clowney uh, Banana Man. Right, right, Ryan. Do I have his name correct? Uh, no. Okay, it's you know his one name. of the greatest actors it, of all time. Is it Robert Downey Sr.? No, wait. Robert Downey Sr. recently passed away. So it must be Junior. Robert Downey Jr. That's right. We're getting a Robert Downey Jr. TV show. That sounds like fun, right? Yeah. I'm down. Yeah. Yeah. He hasn't, he uh, hasn't uh, done anything in a long time. Yeah, no. It, it mean, wasn't he supposed to be a part of Perry Mason before just producing it? Like, wasn't he supposed to act in it? Yeah, but he did. But he decided he didn't want to because he wanted the show to be like on its own. Which is a good He wanted to distract decision. from the show. That's a smart decision. Um, the synopsis for the novel that this is based on is that it's April 1975 and Saigon is in chaos. At his villa, a general of the South Vietnamese army is drinking whiskey and, with the help of his trusted captain, drawing up a list of those who, are, who will be given passage aboard the last flights out of the country. The general and his compatriots start a new life in Los Angeles, unaware that one among their number, the captain, is secretly observing and reporting on the group to a higher up in the Viet Cong. The sympathizer is the story of this captain, a man brought up by the absent French father and a poor Vietnamese mother, a man who went to the uni- to university in America, but returned to Vietnam to fight for the communist cause. This sounds scandalous and I cannot wait to see it. Sounds like fun guys. I'm always down. Yeah. You know, me and Robert Downey. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. Um, moving along to a different part of the MCU. Um, so Black Widow came out last week, uh, did some decent, very decent, in fact, above decent box office for an 80 million domestic opening. And it dropped significantly this week. Uh, thanks definitely in part to what we'll be talking about this week, but, um, the drop off has been, um, uh, was a consternation for theater owners and the national theater association of theater owners decided to point the finger directly at Disney by saying that the decision to put Black Widow on Disney Plus as a $30 purchase feature uh, crippled the box office of Black Widow. I don't know how to read that because... I mean, I, I, mean, I agree with it because <laughs> if it made $60 million last week and now people have unlocked it at home where you don't have to pay again and you can watch it whenever you want. Oh, wait, so you don't have to pay the 30 now? No, you pay it once. Right. And then you don't have to pay it again. So there you lose. So you pay for the $30 and you can watch it again. And you don't have to pay to go watch it again. Okay. Then yeah, definitely has an issue. I thought it was something you had to pay each time for it. Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, then yeah, that definitely uh, would have something to do with it. Uh, at any rate, the national association of theater owners sent a, uh, sent a press release out to basically directly indict Disney plus for that decision. And yeah, knowing that it's definitely an issue. Um, and it's kind of weird seeing a Marvel movie be an issue regarding box office because that has virtually never happened since the MCU started. There hasn't been one of those films that hasn't 
made the amount of money it needs to at the box office to satisfy both the theater owners and the studios. So it's just very bizarre to see. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, given, given how frustrating it was to find that Cruella was still a $30 was a $30 purchase one. That's why I just went to the theater. So I guess people are just more willing to purchase it outright and then just watch it whenever they want to at home, which sucks to be honest. Cause we saw Black Widow in IMAX, Ryan, and it looked fucking fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think they're proving though too that the theatrical window they'll make more money if they just have an exclusive theatrical window. Yeah, which is what basically you know because I was thinking about this too. Um, a lot of Netflix shows are canceled after one season because they spend a lot of money on them, but they only want you to you know pay for the subscription they don't care about your continued vested interest in these shows at all they just want well here's something new here's something new here's something new um it's and there's there is a almost throwaway quality to um movies and tv shows that debut exclusively on streaming platforms Mm -hmm. because it's well it's it's starting to prove it, it, it's starting to prove something that Scorsese was alluding to about it being content and not actual films, which is not to say that what's being made is purely content, but the streaming service is just treating it like content and not yeah. I'll, a piece I'll of talk art. about it in something I've been watching this week. Okay, fair enough. Right on. Um, and then the last piece of news is actually a, a good piece of news. Um, Clerks 3 is officially happening, courtesy of Lionsgate. They announced that the they will be buying the rights to the latest sequel from Kevin Smith. Um, and the plot of the film involves uh, Randall getting a heart attack and deciding to become a filmmaker and making a movie at the quick stop. Uh, and they will be filming the film entirely in New Jersey, just as the first one was filmed, which is honestly a very nice sentiment um, for that to be done. Cause it could, you could easily make it affordable to make clerks three, the way they did in clerks Two by filming it in LA or even, you know, going down to Georgia where the tax incentives are better, but they are choosing to film it in New Jersey where the original was filmed, which is very nice. And I heard they're starting next month. That's fast. Yeah. Well, he's been prepping this for over a year, like, because in COVID definitely sidelined a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, it makes as sense long as he doesn't make it are. NFT available, then I'm good. <sighs> I don't, did, did, no, I mean that, he won't. It's did Lions that Kilroy Gate. movie? Yeah, Lionsgate's not going to do that. Did, did that? Did that Kilroy movie even fucking come out? Like for anybody at know. all? Then there you go. Like if it's an NFT, then why make that an option? If you know, I I mean I like Spike Lee, but apparently Spike Lee's promoting these NFTs too now, and I'm just like, yeah, but then there's no guarantee that people will see your content. So why are you making your content? I don't, I I don't get it. But anyway, that's news. Unless I missed anything of uh, value to you guys. Nope. Here's movies coming out on Blu-ray and Ultra HD. DVD releases and Blu-rays. Before we talk about what's coming out this week, Ryan, can we gush over what we just got announced on the Criterion Collection? There's two fucking hot titles. <laughs> sure. We got so Criterion Collection announced its October lineup, and amongst the titles that will be coming out in October are one, uh, the classic Raoul Walsh, Humphrey Bogart, Ida Lupino. Uh, production of High Sierra. This is the movie that Bogart made before he got a little call to play Sam Spade for the Maltese Falcon uh, back in 1941. And High Sierra is a wonderful movie where he plays basically the last bastion of his gangster mold before he fully assimilated into the anti-hero. Um, and you will also get an additional feature, Colorado Territory, which is the Western remake of High Woo! Sierra. Colorado! Done? Yep. <laughs> Denver rule. <laughs> uh, and, but also this is the one that the big one that uh, listeners of this show will probably be a little more tuned into is uh, if you'll recall, we reviewed a little movie called uncut gems uh, back when it was released. And that is joining the criterion collection. Ryan, I'm going to point it out right here, right now. Adam Sandler has two movies in the criterion collection. Isn't that I know he should have, I want him also to release a uh, Merowitz stories as well. So hopefully that sounds like Netflix might do that at some point. Yeah, because it's um it's Bombach, so they already did Marriage Story. Yep, maybe 
maybe we'll get it. Who knows? Um, but we have to wait till October for those. Uh, so oh, right. until then, Ryan, we all know what you really, really want in your life. Tell me what Joe, I want. What I really, really Joe, want. the rise of GI <laughs> Joe, the rise of Cobra in 4K. That's what everybody wants, right? Yeah, sure. Or, or you can get GI Joe, Joe Retaliation, starring Dwayne the Rock Johnson and a bald-headed douchebag named Bruce Willis. Uh, you can get those on 4K if you so wish. Um, you can also get Eight Legged Freaks from Shout Factory. That's a cool one. This isn't a collector's edition, though, is it, Ryan? It is not. The movie is okay. Yeah, <laughs> it it's, got a, it's got a cult. It's got a cult following around it, from what I've understood. Sure. So. Um, you can also get season three of Star Trek Discovery on Blu-ray. Uh, and uh, coming off of the hot new releases, you can get Spiral from the Book of Saw um, on 4K, both in a regular edition and in Steelbook. And I'm going to say the Steelbook looks kind of cool. Looks pretty fun. Uh, and then this one, I didn't think Blue Underground was doing 4K unless, I, uh, unless we've talked about one they've done before, but they're putting out Dead and Buried from 1981 in 4k uh so if you'd like to check out some blue underground 4k there is your chance uh shout select is putting out little big league from 1994 uh looks like it's a big baseball consuming a small child on a bicycle uh that's all i really know about this movie um and it came out of the time when was, there's angels in the outfield um what was the other uh kid who was that is that the one where the kid like hurts his arm and he can throw really fast Brad, do you Angels remember? In the outfield? No, that's no, the one. no, little big league. Oh. Um, I, th- I just remember seeing the poster as a kid with like a little, like there's like a lineup of professional baseball players, and then there's like a kid sticking his head down. No, this is the plot for Little Big League, guys. A 12 year old boy inherits the Minnesota Twins and designates himself the team manager. I can imagine that being a 12-year-old kid, a hijinks will ensue when he has to manage a bunch of three-year-old men. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, right, Ryan, I think you're thinking of uh, Rookie of the Year. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And he's like funky butt-loving when he hits the doctor in the face. What? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Angel in the Outfield. I, I, I saw the movie once or twice on video, but the trailer sticks out more in my mind because one of the lines is like, dad, when are we going to be a family again? He's like, I say when the angels win the pennant. And it's just like, that's a stupid bet to make with your son. Cause you know, he's going to win because it's a Disney movie. And that's why his father abandons him in that movie. Anyway, moving on. Uh, you can also get something called flight to Mars from 1951 uh, from, it looks like the film detective is putting this one out, Ryan. They've been putting out some interesting stuff with Laurel and Hardy and um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Oh no, the film detective actually put out uh night in Casablanca uh, flicker alley has been the one that's putting out the Laurel and Hardy stuff. Um, and then a stranger is watching is coming out from shout factory on Blu-ray um beneath new york's grand central station a killer can hide victims can disappear a killer can hide victims a killer can hide victims can disappear and a million witnesses will never know it happened ryan can you solve the the mystery of a stranger is watching with your detective skills (laughs) possibly okay i'm gonna rely on you for this uh and then this one is actually interesting because i'm glad this finally exists that in a way that i I did because I th- I thought for whatever reason this wasn't available, but Brad, you'll be interested in this. MV- MVD is putting out the Go Go Boys, the inside story of Canon Films, which was the competing documentary that Galan and Gulbis made to compete with Electric Boogaloo, the story of Canon Films. <laughs> so this is the alternative documentary uh, for your Canon knowledge. Um, so I I'm actually going to go ahead and purchase this because I'd like to see what Galan and Globus themselves put together. Um, Warner Archive is putting out Take Me Out to the Ball Game from 1949 featuring Frank Sinatra, Esther Williams and a certain Gene Kelly who also starred with Frank Sinatra in such sensational hits as The Pirate and Anchors Away. So anyway check out Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Uh, you can also get the Gary Cooper Paul Ag Goddard movie Unconquered from Keanu Lorber. You can also get Gary Cooper and Gene Arthur in The Plainsman. In fact, I'll just say this right now. Keanu Lorber is giving you a good selection of Gary Cooper movies this week. <laughs> um, they're also giving you Claudette Colbert's The Gilded Lady from 1935 featuring Fred McMurray and Ray Milland. 
Um, and then we'll bring it over back to Warner Archive for a second. They are giving you I Wouldn't Be in Your Shoes from 1948 and Step by Step from 1946. Uh, so, yeah, a good chunk of fun things coming your way on Blu-ray this week. So the Saw movies are being released on Blu-ray again, but whatever. But, I mean, have they updated anything worthy? Like the cover any special features? <laughs> okay, that's, that's not updates. That's 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 as simple as changing and uh, changing a pdf for a second i'm talking about bonus features <laughs> well if you're a uh, cover art ocd person like me um you can appreciate having consistent cover art but you do you i guess fair enough i mean those these covers do look fun but uh I don't know if I'd say fun. <laughs> I'd rather yeah. just have special features. Um, okay, fun for the Saw universe. How about that? Do you, did you like that qualifier? Well, also, they did that eight pack, which I think they took all the special features out of. So these, I think you'll probably get them back because they're all individually packaged. We'll see. Maybe You never know. Maybe. All right. Maybe this was worthwhile. Yeah, I'll just announce it here. Yeah, you can go ahead and get your uh, these new releases of the Saw films individually with uh, saw blades that have little emblems inside them like they're collector coins. Um, and that's Blu-rays. Man, you skipped over Bye Bye Birdie with Dick Van Dyke? Unbelievable. I did, I did not see Bird, Bye Bye Birdie here. Wait, do you mean Fitzwilly? No, Fitzwilly is in August. Oh. Uh, Bye Bye Birdie is this week. You're right. I'm sorry. Bye Bye Birdie featuring Dick Van Dyke and Paul Land uh, uh, coming, uh, coming to you. From uh, Sony Pictures, 1963 classic musical film. Ryan, do you do you like this just as much as Mary Poppins, or do you like Mary Poppins more? I, mean, just, I like Mary Bye Poppins Birdie. more, but Bye Bye Birdie's great. It, I I'm in the camp of liking Bye Bye Birdie more just because. Well, you're wrong. No, it's this isn't about being wrong. Anybody can like any movie they like. I just appreciate how insane Bye Bye Birdie is in certain respects with it dealing with commenting on show business in general. Mary Poppins is like a heartwarming treat. Bye Bye Birdie's just like kick back and have a lot of fun. And amongst other things, watch Paul Lind do one of the greatest musical sequences of all time with kids. I don't know what's wrong with these kids today. Um, but anyway, yeah, pick up Bye Bye Birdie. I'm sorry, I did not see that, guys. Thank you for pointing that out. What a dickhead. Why would I? What? No, I'm not a dick. I'm, I'm a generally decent person when I'm not forgetting about Paul Lind movies. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Zach, we watch... I think you're okay. No, that's a lie. No, and I want, uh, <laughs> Corinne, I have to ask you because you brought this up on Twitter. Why do you like movies spoiled for you? I don't know. I just, that's how I roll. When I got the last Harry Potter book, guess what I did? I flipped to the end of the book. Just to see how it all turned out. I just, that's how I roll. I don't know what to tell you. Corinne watch, likes watching all movies like they're Quentin Tarantino movies. Yes, you, you start at a middle point or an end point. And then yeah, you but she's not it. watching them. She's reading about it. Doesn't that take away something in the translation of the film when you go and see it, though? No, well, not necessarily. I mean, when I saw, um, you know, Terminator 2, I already knew the twist that, you know, Arnold was actually the good guy. So... You know, I don't think I, that's a twist. I think that's in the trailer. <laughs> well, it is. Some it literally people said... in 1991 didn't know about it, I'm sure. I mean, the movie sets it up so that it's kind of ambiguous. I think the marketing just did it wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm... that's not the same as you reading stuff on Tumblr to see what happens in movies. I just don't get it. Mm. I mean, it, like I said, it was a good thing I read the Star Wars spoilers for The Rise of Skywalker because... Oh boy, if that had happened in the theater and I didn't know about it, there would have been fists thrown. How do you Ooh. throw how do you throw your own fists? Do you have detachable hands? Oh, I would have just been beaten up like anybody and everybody. Oh, that's that that's that's not appropriate theater. Anybody who would have cheered friend. or made some kind of comment after like, oh, it was a good thing he died, I'd be like, All right, time to fight. Well, Wait, and- why do you like Ben Solo so much? It's a good thing he died. He doesn't deserve to live. Uh, did we not spend like two and a half whole movies like building up his redemption arc? He did redeem himself by helping Ray. Yeah, exactly. So why couldn't he live and make amends? Because he killed billions of people. 
he was uh, okay, but he's still alive. Like, can't he? No, that's unredeemable. Dar- you can't Darth- redeem someone like that. Darth Vader killed the Emperor, and he still died. Yeah. It, it even though even though they redeem themselves in some form or fashion, they still have to die because they are the conventional villain. Because that's how Star Wars movies and most sci-fi plots work when they're not nuanced. Because they're just there to deliver the basic story. And, that, and, and Solo stay. had a lot more nuance from the very beginning than Darth Vader ever did. <laughs> that, and I'll always stand by, they're responsible for the death of billions of people. They don't deserve to live. Yeah, well, uh, you know, Avatar The Last Airbender and Once Upon a Time would like to have a word with you. <laughs> and Roroni Kenshin. I mean, I have watched Wait, a lot the of the TV shows. show Once Upon a Time? Yes. There's... There's a guy in Once Upon a Time that kills billions of people. Not billions, but one lady is responsible for the death of deaths of hundreds of people. Yeah, that's not redeemable. And she got a <laughs> redemption arc. She's like one of the heroes by season three. Yeah, that's not, you can't be redeemed from that. Only because she was under contract and they had to give her something to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, she played a great villain. R- Ryan. That's it, Regina. She's the evil queen. And she fu- and he fucking killed his own dad. You don't yeah, get but even his dad that. forgave him for that, Ryan. Did you his... not see the look on his face? He did stroke his cheek as if though to think there was still good in Ben. Exactly. That or he's shocked that he just got killed by his own kid. No, it was definitely a gesture of love and forgiveness. Nope, shock. Also, Han Solo, like, Harrison Ford wanted Han Solo to die. That's the only reason he came back, so... Well, yeah, because he wanted him to die as far back as Return of the Jedi. Exactly. Yep. Can't redeem somebody for killing billions of people. He was Can't. only, like, he was only terrificially involved in that. Peripherally involved. He was uh, I'm pretty sure he gave the speech. order. <laughs> he was part of the First Order. He was part of the upper tier of people. But he did yeah. not make the call to blow up that system. I can't remember the name of it. Ben Solo fucked around and found out. So Ben Solo was only following orders, right? Yeah, so was uh, Gerbil. And look what happened to him. Yep. See, that's what I'm saying is he could have lived and then nope. made amends for what he did by working no. for the side of good. You cannot make amends for blowing up a whole planet. Sorry. Well, can't okay. happen. well you got to try. Don't people deserve a second chance? No. <laughs> okay, this isn't real life, though, Ryan. This is fiction. Yeah, even in fiction, you don't deserve a second chance for killing that many people. Does does uh, uh, Joe Cool deserve a second chance for killing Batman's parents? Fuck no. That's Joe, Joe Chill. Chill. That's Joe Chill. Joe. What cool. did I say? <laughs> Joe, Joe Snoopy. Snoopy. <laughs> he said Joe. Uh, cool. Yeah, I mean Joe. <laughs> Joe Chill. Yeah. Snoopy's cousin. Wait, too. wait, Ryan. I liked your little "what if" scenario of Snoopy shooting Tom and Martha well, Wayne. Okay, yeah. Even if that happened, <laughs> if Snoopy killed Tom and Martha Wayne, he doesn't deserve to be redeemed. <laughs> Red Baron strikes again. <laughs> right after he shoots them, he just goes. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's my code that I live by, whether it's real life or fiction, is that if people, you know, are contrite and they want to do better, then you have to give them a chance to do better. Did you not see The Good Place? Uh, Yeah, but also, he did do better. He helped Ray. That's his redemption arc. That's all he needs. Nope. Nope. He can live and continue to do good things. Nope. So, Doesn't so, deserve to. So Ryan, Snoopy is the uh, World War One flying ace, first beagle on the moon, and known murderer of the Wayne of the Wayne fortune. Yep, <laughs> I would watch that. I would watch that. Um, he just flies into the the Gotham alleyway and shoots the Waynes. It's not what I. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me, Charlie Brown. <laughs> I said I will never understand Corinne. Um. She wants spoilers. She thinks that Ben Solo can be redeemed, and she refuses to see Toy Story 4. Speaking of which, this is stuff we watched this week. Did you Alfred, you Toy blockhead. <laughs> Did you watch Toy what? Story 4, Ryan? No, I'm just bringing it up because you have oh. this weird stance on it. Anyways, hey, Brad, what'd you watch this week? I'm tired of listening to those two. Cool, Thanks. me first. 
So, uh, yeah, this is the stuff we've been watching. Um, yeah, I guess right off the bat, Loki. I re- I watched Loki, the finale of Loki. What was that Loved last it. week? Um, yeah, like other than the fact that it was, um, you know, 30 minutes of people sitting in chairs and talking to each other. Um, no, I kind of like that, though. I'll be honest, because um, it, it scaled it back and it made it more personal. I was going to say yeah. that the, 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 the consequences of it, like there's just this sense of dread that, you know, for, for something that's not like a bombastic finale, you're just left going like, oh, my God. Like yep. these uh, Kang variants, the, the implications they have for the uh, future of the, the multiverse is just terrifying. And I think it's really uh, fascinating, too, where, um, you know, Loki is offered the throne, but he's been offered the throne before and he doesn't want that. Yeah, I've been trying to so... figure out like what the purpose of this series has been other than introducing the multiverse. Um, like that's the forefront, but like using Loki to do that, like what's behind that? Well, because he he fucked up the timeline by taking the Tesseract. I know, but he... I, I was going to finish my thought. <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. Um and I, like by the end you you see that i feel like they've used this to turn him into a hero because he by the end he finally realizes um you know his motivation to be the trickster all the time just leaves him alone you know that even yeah. the other loki can't even be like him and so i think going forward he may be someone who actually helps solve this multiverse problem which would be kind well, of he's he's always going to be a wild card because he's been given, I mean, Mobius said it, you've literally stabbed every person in the back. Um, so I think he finally... I don't know what his uh, quote unquote end game is, but it seems like there's obviously, well, there's obviously going to be more to his story, but. Well, I just, that, that performance by Tom Hiddleston sitting there before he realizes he's in a new timeline, you know, uh, like a new version of the TVA that doesn't recognize him. Like he has just that he's just staring into the distance. And I kind of got the impression that he was looking like, you know, I'm never going to get what I want if I keep doing this, you know, mm-hmm. like I wanted to be with Sylvie or myself. And it's just like, it's always going to hurt me. Um, like I saw in the, um, the flashbacks in the first episode. So I think it might be the motivation to make him a protagonist in the, you know, phase four should be kind of cool. Possibly. Um, oh, wait, Ryan, do you think that Loki reserves deserves to be redeemed? No, he's not on a redemption quest. I mean, he's definitely been given a lot of sympathy in terms of, you know, character development. You're supposed to feel sorry for him and root for him. Right. I, I don't feel sorry for Loki. He'll I don't think that's the point of, the of what I think, he's done. I think, yeah, I think I don't, I don't feel sorry or sorrow for him. I think he realizes, I mean, even, but see, that's not the same thing. Cause even in his arc, his only goal really is to, to be in charge of Asgard. He doesn't have these huge like aspirations to rule the world. The only reason remember he went to earth was because he was given an opportunity. So I don't know. I, I mean, and he's also hasn't killed a billion people. So he was responsible for the deaths of, I mean, at least hundreds, maybe thousands of people in New York with the attack in 2012. Yeah. And that's why he's locked away. He's not redeemed from that. And he tried to be the hero and kill Thanos and he died for it. So, yep. Yeah, uh, exactly. That's his redemption is he tried to save Thor and he still died for it. Well, in the one time. Again, line, villains cannot be redeemed. Different Loki. Uh, where was I? Stay out of my booze. <laughs> There's something else about that episode um, that I was curious about, but this discussion has derailed that. So, um, yeah, I just um, I was gonna say that I know, like we had been talking about, oh, like it might be King the Conqueror, and I didn't know that that's who the you know the one who remains. I didn't realize that's who it was because they never call him King the Conqueror. Well, 
it's just kind of frustrating that you only find these things out because you have to go on the internet of like oh yeah so it's the same thing that happened in Justice League, the Snyder Cut, you know, where like Martian Manhunter showed up and they never explained who he is or what he's doing there. I guess at no. the end it says, I'm the Martian Manhunter, but you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> but it's like here, like at least when, you know, Zack Snyder, like I knew who that was the whole time, but here I'm like, I don't know who this dude is. Maybe it's Kang, maybe it's somebody else. I've never uh, heard he- of the one who remains. Uh, he who remains is Kang from the 31st century. He tells you everything. He tells you he's a conqueror. Well, the, the this guy is the yeah, guy but holding. People aren't super fans of the comics, so they don't know who Kang the Conqueror is. He's never been in like a, a Marvel movie or anything else before. True. I mean, but it's no different than Thanos looking at the screen and at the end of Avengers. Yeah, but that was an Easter egg. That was like an end credit scene. This is part of the main episode the finale yeah and he tells you what he's up to and he's technically not and he's technically not Kang I mean he's a variant of him right but still it's just kind of frustrating that it's like oh they don't tell you straight up that he is Kang the Conqueror you have to like infer it but it's only possible if you already knew who Kang the Conqueror was because you're a comic super fan but not everybody is I mean, I didn't like it in Zack Snyder's Justice League, and I'll call it out here, too, that, you know, we need to clue people in who are not big, you know, super fans and everything. (laughs) So do you want me to go, uh, I am from the 31st century. Some people call me Conqueror. Kang the Conqueror. I mean, maybe. Why couldn't he have just said his name was Kang? Because it's not. His name is He Who Remains. Would he have his sister Kodos with him? Hello. I'm pretty sure he was not, like, on his birth certificate, it did not say he who remains. Well, right. yeah, because I think his, uh, that's not his actual name. Any Kang isn't his actual name either. Mm. Anyway, I mean, it was okay. It was a decent finale. I definitely liked the last bit where he shows up at the TVA and he's trying to talk to Mobius and Mobius is like, wait, who are you? Do you work in accounting? And yeah, that acting from Tom Hiddleston is perfect. I was reading, Ryan or Brad, maybe you can double check me, but I heard that Loki was supposed to be a 12 episode series and like it got shut down halfway through because of COVID. So they actually um, basically split it into two and that's why we're going to get a second season. Had you guys heard that as well? No, I heard that it was only supposed to be one season and then it did so well that they decided to make a second one. Uh, there's an interview with the director uh, and she talks about it. That Brad, what else did you watch? <laughs> I guess I'll move on. Um, yeah, because hey, Corinne just dropped off, I guess. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's not Kang the Conqueror. It's he who remains, I guess, Kang Prime, but, like, he's not the Conqueror. Everyone else. No, because, I mean, he's his holding back is, his, yeah. His actual name is Nathaniel Richards, and he's, like, 10 different names throughout, like, history. So he, he ha- yeah, he's a descendant of Reed, Reed Richards, right? Yeah. So he just goes all over the place. That's why he's also, a, like, a pharaoh called Rama Tut. He's, uh, Immortus, um, he's fuck uh give me a couple more minutes and i'll think of his other shit he is but anyway what else if you watch Brad? yeah it doesn't matter um so speaking of loki i watched the mask um from 94 with jim carrey mm-hmm. i don't think i've seen it since then and uh the backstory is that the mask comes from loki okay. that's right mm-hmm. yep um hold up for you <laughs> No, uh, it was a lot worse than I remember. Um, I think the acting in that movie is horrible. It's a comic book movie, which I forgot about from Dark Horse. And um, the uh, I will say the animation and special effects are pretty impressive. Like They have a very Roger Rabbit quality to them. Um, but the story is just so lame and the jokes are so bad. Um yeah, Stan Lipkiss is a bank uh, teller who is just 
everything goes wrong for him. Um, but they set up like with a cutaway shot that he's like into Looney Tunes <laughs> cartoons. And I yeah, think he's into like Acme stuff and like Tex Avery specifically because they reference the wolf cartoons a lot. Well, they also he has like a magazine in his work desk drawer that like that's something about Looney Tunes. And then when he goes home, he's watching them on his TV before he finds the mask. Um, so yeah, it just it just deals with the uh, because the the villain by the end of the movie also takes on the mask, but he doesn't turn into a silly goof. Um, you know, he kind of turns like into a demon. Yeah, like, like a Frankenstein. I haven't seen the movie in so long. Yeah. So anyway, that guy's running a crime front through his. I don't know, Popa Cabana Club or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, Stanley Ip- Ipkiss basically turns into a cartoon character for an hour and a half and thwarts that and, um, you know, realizes he doesn't really need the mask. He just needs self confidence and to get everything he wants. And yeah, it's just kind of lame. Um, yeah, the police guy in there drove me crazy. His line delivery when he's, I, I just always remember, all right, all right, unfreeze. Oh, yeah. Ugh. And the dog is trained really well to do some cool tricks and stuff. So that's fun. <laughs> um, like the whole scene where the dog has to go steal the keys so he can break out of jail is pretty yeah. impressive. Um, but yeah, I was like, I can't, I'm just so surprised that this movie was so popular back then. Um, it really just a, coasted it, on Jim Carrey's star power at the time. <laughs> It's a it's a living cartoon. Like there is a there is still an affection for it. Like it's been a while since I watched it, but I remember liking it the last time I watched it. Like yeah. it's it is what literally watching a cartoon come to life. Like not in the Roger Rabbit way, but like the next best thing to that. Like if you're going to manifest it in a you know a human form, is literally the man with the rubberest face in the world, Jim Carrey. So, I mean, I, but I guess I'd have to rewatch it to see how much it's aged. Yeah, it's just a lot of the jokes are cheesy, obnoxious, and uh, just direct ripoffs of stuff from the Acme stuff. So, anyway, um, yeah, that's it. I talked about Barb and Star last week, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's it for me. Corinne, what did you watch this week? Uh, not too much. Uh, just well, other than Loki, just two things. I started binge watching a show called Virgin River on Netflix, and it is just pure just cheesy melodrama, um, kind of the same sort of vibe that you get from one of those like Hallmark Christmas movies, but maybe like a slightly better, slightly better writing, slightly better production value, but very cheesy. I, I think I compared it to Everwood at one point. I was like, you know, it's kind of in that vein, maybe a little bit more melodramatic, but um, it's about this, uh, you know, nurse from Los Angeles who um, she has some kind of marital issues. You don't find out what exactly until like midway through season one. Um, so she leaves Los Angeles and she goes to this small town in the mountains called Virgin River and she meets this handsome bartender and they kind of hit it off and she's supposed to be helping this uh, elderly doctor who's, you know, he, he's, he should be retiring soon, but he's like really cranky and he doesn't think he needs the help. And um, so anyway, it's like a lot of drama. And so there's three seasons. I'm already like halfway through season three. So there's only like five more episodes left. It's 10 episodes per season, three seasons total. And it's like 45 minutes an episode. So, I mean, it goes by pretty fast. Um, But they always leave you on a cliffhanger. So you're like, oh, shit, like I got to watch the next one. (laughs) Because I was like halfway through the first episode. And I'm like, really? Like, this is it? This is all we're going to get? And then the cliffhanger comes up and I'm like, oh, okay. I actually have to start watching it. (laughs) So it's it's okay. Um, They, I think season one was maybe the strongest just because of the different dynamics between the characters and there's maybe only like four or five people that they focus on for the first season but then in the second season they kind of expanded out to you know maybe like eight to ten and then they expanded out even more in season three and so there are certain people and storylines that I'm like I don't care about them so I fast forward <laughs> so by the time you get to season three but season one was a lot better and it's kind of interesting how so not the main couple, but there's a secondary couple on the show 
and you start off kind of liking the gal because she kind of you know comes in and she kind of tells it like it is and the guy's like really grumpy and doesn't like anybody doesn't trust anybody but then by the end of the season it's flipped because the the gal gets like really involved and she oversteps boundaries with uh, other people and the guy's like finally starting to come around on certain things so you're like ah you know it's so frustrating it's like I was rooting for you and and now you're just being this little turd and then the other guy's like okay I'm glad to see you're growing here buddy and so it's it is what it is it's just kind of stupid fun mindless show so it's the kind of thing okay. like, hmm? sometimes shows like that is, are okay yeah <laughs> it's the kind of show that my stepmom would watch and I actually when I started watching it I was like have you ever heard of Virgin River you would like it and she's like oh yeah I've already seen it <laughs> so anyway check it out if you want it's called Virgin River it's on Netflix um I don't know if there's supposed to be a fourth season I haven't heard or bothered to look it up yet because once I get to the season three finale I might be like oh like what's what's going on like I gotta have a season four but I don't know what's going on yet And then the other thing I watched is I watched the latest episode of The Owl House, and it is fantastic. Um, The show continues to deliver really good content. The plot was great. We got a lot of good character revelations and character growth. You get to meet, um, well, I guess we've met him earlier in the season, but one of the antagonists who was introduced late season one, early season two, and he... um, you, 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 you think he's just this like little brat and sure enough, like you kind of find out why and you, you're starting to be like, oh no, like I want to adopt him, like precious little baby, you should not have to deal with the bullshit you do. And um, it was just really interesting. You, you got, I think a lot of uh, the people I was interacting with online, they were so caught up in like the character revelations that we got that they kind of overlooked, I think, some of the big plot things that happened <laughs> just because it's kind of hidden in the background. It's like, oh, so nobody's talking about the villain's plan that was basically revealed in this episode and some of these other details that are going to be pretty big down the road. But OK, but it's kind of fun to, you know, everybody's kind of theorizing and like, oh, maybe this character is related to this character. or This character is like, you know, wanting to do this. I don't want to spoil too much for you, but um, it's a really great show. Good for, you know, kids. I'd say, you know, five and up would probably enjoy it. But it's The Owl House. Um, season one is on Disney Plus, And then season two is elsewhere. <laughs> um, I think it's like Disney Now or something like that. But anyway, I highly recommend everybody at least check out season one. Uh, but season two so far has been a lot better. So that's all I've been watching. Zach. Alrighty. Um, I watched a couple of things. Um, like I said, from the uh, local segment, um, uh, the dairy art center is kicking off its Friday night weird programming again. So I went to my first ever uh, attendance to that event to see a movie called censor. It's a new horror movie uh, that premiered at Sundance. I think earlier this year. Um, it's a movie that Ryan, I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Um, it's kind of like if you took in the mouth of madness and made it about the video nasty scandals that were going on in the UK in the eighties. Um, for anybody who doesn't know what the video nasties are, I'm not an expert on it fully myself, but there was a big crackdown in the UK on horror titles to the point where several, um, mainstream horror titles and obviously low level horror titles were banned in the UK and it was illegal to sell them in the UK. Um, and the story of this film uh, involves a woman who is uh, working for the censorship board um, that's censoring these horror movies and either giving them the approval to be released or to be banned and rejected. And she comes across a tape uh, or a, a film uh, that's uh, being screened for approval that may or may not connect to her past with her sister disappearing. And the film goes off into a mystery territory of does something within the world of the horror films being made in the, uh, in in the eighties and uh, the late seventies, early eighties have anything to do with her, her sister's disappearance. And the movie is really, really good. Um, It's an hour and 24 minute movie that crams a lot in super efficiently. Um, It's got some good scares. 
Uh, the main form of terror that's pulsating through it is actually a commentary on what censorship, the actual, like what, the consequences of censorship. And it's like, it almost speaks to the larger issue of censorship period when it comes to film specifically using the UK video nasties as its main footing. But it, it, it gets at like an essential truth about the consequences of censorship and the perception that people who have the desire to censor art um, are at the foothold of from an emotional point. Um, really fantastic, super well put together. Like it looks like it was on a low budget, but it, 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 it moves efficiently for that. And it, it has a lot of creative flourishes to make it look like it has a bigger budget than it does. And it's, it's, it's pretty fantastic. I had a good time with it, Ryan. So I think if anybody's going to appreciate it, it probably will be you. Um, Sweet. Uh, and then I was uh, a guest last night on the punk rock horror podcast. Um, and they asked me to come on to talk about David Cronenberg. And it's been a while since I've been back to Cronenberg land. So I crammed in four of his movies within the span of 48 hours uh, so I started off with um, a movie that I had never seen before, which is called Crash. Um, and it is a movie about people who are sexually attracted to car crashes. Uh, and Crash into me. <laughs> if the Dave Matthews Band had played in that movie, I think it would have made it 10 times more unsettling than it already was. Um, I will say what I said on that show. This, this crash, whatever I feel about it, still 10 times better than 2005's Crash. Now, that being said, um, it, the movie is very unnerving, very unsettling. Um, it's like, like any Cronenberg movie. It's going to test the limits between how one perceives sex and violence intertwined. Um, and it, it is, uh, it's, it's not a film I, it's like a weird film to recommend to people because it's kind of like mother where it's just like, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. And I still don't know where I lie in the camp of crash um, because there is something valuable in the, in the art itself, but it's not something I'd go back to right away in terms of Cronenberg. Um, I can see why the criterion collection picked it up because it has all the makings of what a good criterion release would be reading into the scandal of its release honestly was a lot, a lot more engaging than the film itself for me, but the film is kind of keeping you at a distance anyway, intentionally. So it's not like it's asking you to fully invest yourself in these characters. It's rather asking you to observe them absolutely on an objective basis. Um, but James Spader is in it, Holly Hunter, Elias Coteus, uh, and Rosanna Arquette. So it's got a pretty stacked cast. One of the most bizarre sequences in the movie, hands down, for me, apart from pretty much everything else going on, is uh, uh, the group of people that get together that have this similar fetish. Uh, one of the scenes involves Elias Coteus and another stunt driver uh, recreating for this group of enthusiasts uh, the James Dean car crash uh, that killed James Dean in the 50s. So it's, it's, again, it's Cronenberg walking a fine line between what an audience will take and not take. And there's a part of me that will always approve of that. But there is also this element of me going like, I don't know if I'd watch this again. Um, so yeah, I, I know my review seems a little like wobbly, but the movie is very hard to, it's hard for me to make a judgment call on it. Um, the, I mean, it's the got epi- James Spader in it. How can you go wrong? Did you hear what I said about the plot of the movie, Craig? <laughs> yeah, all I heard was James Spader, and then I tuned the rest out. Okay, uh, James Spader, sexually attracted to car crashes. Uh, and then that's what you need I mean, to that kind of seems like James Spader's MO, if, you're, if we're being honest. Well, he did turn into an AI who might also be sexual. Was Ultron sexually attracted to car wrecks? That's that's I mean, my maybe question. we never saw a car wreck on screen. I, I don't know, Ryan. Is there a Marvel issue that covers that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> um, uh, it's also it's it's also really weird to see Holly Hunter doing it. To be honest, but I guess Holly Hunter was. This is like it's it's not the Holly Hunter we think of today in certain respects. But I guess it's I don't know. Like she's always been an adventurous actress, so it's not like this is like unwarranted of her to do, but. Anyway, though, I also went back to Scanners. Um, Scanners is still a lot of fun. 
I liked digging into the bonus features on that because they had some interviews on the Criterion with um, the special effects team. And one of the stories, um, I, I don't know if anybody's heard this, but uh, one of the special effects guys by the name of Gary, uh, it, when you watch him being interviewed, talking about the special effects, everybody else is kind of like, you know, a little bit more flippant and a little bit more engaging in the interview. And this one guy, Gary, he's the most calm, straightforward individual you ever meet, you will ever listen to in an interview. But then everybody else around him talks about how essentially crazy he is. <laughs> and he's responsible for the head explosion bit that Scanners is so famous for at the beginning uh, being pulled off because they had to shoot that outside of the location where the majority of that scene takes place because of I think it was scheduling or it was a reshoot but they had the design all set up but they didn't have any way to trigger it off to where the head would explode and so this guy Gary sits in the back as the special effects wizard with a shotgun pointed straight up at an angle at the at the back of the head and then they blast the head as the camera rolls and the effect that you watch there's a guy in the back with a shot shooting a shotgun blast that's creating that effect. So it's, it's quite fascinating to watch and given what the production was on that film and how much the script was being rewritten and retooled, it's, it's amazing that the movie comes out as wonderful as it is in certain respects. Uh, and then I rewatched the fly, which is still a masterpiece. That's a great way to reinvent the fly. Um, and uh, Goldblum's wonderful in it. Gina Davis is killer in it. Um, you know, Ryan and I, Ryan, you and I have talked about this before, but that that scene with her giving birth to <laughs> a little larvae is <laughs> just is still creepy as shit. Um, yep. Yeah, and also I, I guess it, it's 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 1986. It's been a while. At the very end, when Brundle Fly finally just you know, she's about to shoot him, but she can't do it. And then he, you see Brundle Fry just pull the shotgun barrel up to his own head. <laughs> like, it's just this weird detail of the puppet. That I'm like, this is like, this is a character coming out of this essentially disheveled and deformed puppet that has emerged several different times out of the teleporter. It's odd. It's, it's a wonderful film. Um, Mel Brooks is a madman for putting money into movies like this, and I adore him for it. Um, and I actually rewatched the original fly from 1958 to do a compare and contrast because I've never watched the two side by side. And it's been a while since I've watched the original fly because it's the one it's one I don't go back to a lot. And probably for good reason. The first one is not amazing. It's still fun. You still get a good a good amount of Vincent Price in it. But he is truly a side character in the movie that gets more screen time than a side character normally would, um, because the first two thirds of the movie is all set up for what eventually happens with the scientist turning, splicing himself with the fly. Um, I will say though, I really still love the reveal of the fly head and how it's handled. It's, it's a 50 sci-fi horror movie that doesn't feel it's cheesy, but it's not, it is trying to go for something with pantomime and, emotion behind it it's not trying to be completely cynical of itself or a cash grab only um the color looks beautiful and um the effect of what happens to the other half of him as his fly self uh trapped in the web is still unsettling despite the fact that i know that that's all that's 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 like a very early form of what blue screen tech and uh uh black velvet special effects can do it's still kind of unnerving to watch that half of the body being uh approached by a giant fake spider and then seeing the inspector whack all of it with a rock like it does work um but it it amazed me how much cronenberg did lift off of the original and chose to incorporate into his remake so it was actually kind of like pleasant to see how he takes things in the fly and elaborates on them from a thematic level and not on a story level. So like there are moments in the original fly that are literally throwaway things that he expands upon from human behavior in his version of the fly. And it in essence makes it a better movie. Um, and then I rewatched Videodrome, which still worked for me. Um, it's, it's, it's a strange film to begin with. It falls like it's, it's weird. It, it comes out three years before 
they live and i feel like they live is a more effective commentary on some form of consumption from the 80s perspective but cronenberg's tackling mass consumption of media and carpenters uh, approaching it from the more capitalistic material goods gains and videodrome still does its job very effectively uh, obviously it's very hard to watch that movie because its lead actor is a giant asshole um, but once you get past that um, the the movie still works its magic pretty well those special effects are still unsettling and creepy um, so I mean, if you haven't seen Videodrome, it's like any Cronenberg movie. Watch with caution if you're squeamish with body horror and some very, very edgy, transgressive things going on. But if you're able to get in, if you're able to get into the mindset of what Cronenberg's doing, you're going to have a blast. Um, so, yeah. So overall, David Cronenberg, weird guy, makes some fun movies. Um, and uh, and then I went to film club and we did a James Cagney double bill. So we watched the roaring twenties from 1939. Uh, and then we watched white heat from 1949, both films directed by Raoul Walsh, both classics of the gangster genre. Um, Raoul Walsh is a guy who basically he defines a lot of elements of the gangster genre in the silent era. And then pr- improves upon them in the roaring twenties. And then 10 years later in 49, he, arguably perfects it with white heat because white heat is a creme de la creme for gangster films because Cagney's character of Cody Jarrett is the definitive psychological profile of the psychopathic gangster that you see down the line in films by either Scorsese Coppola or heck even Cronenberg with some of his gangster fare that he did with Eastern Promises you see the evolution of the kind of person that gets involved in crime and in the case of Cody Jarrett it's a psychological manifestation of headaches that started off as him faking it and then they became real and he's got this mother fixation and it's all tor- all sorts of wonderful thematic elements crammed into a 1949 film which almost seems impossible but the evidence is right there in this two-hour spectacle of a masterpiece um so yeah if you haven't seen white heat or the roaring 20s check them both out they're fucking incredible uh and then the last thing that i watched was more futurama um i went i finally started digging into the comedy central seasons um and it's been a while since i've been back to those seasons and i didn't watch them as often as i watched the first fox run <laughs> and um they're still funny i think that forwarding uh, the them pushing forward in time episode is still a master class um it's still a lovely story with especially when leela shoots a message in the cavern on the green that fry then sees a, over a billion years later um it's just, it's further proof that futurama is able to tell wonderfully emotional stories while having the most off the wall irreverent humor imaginable and Uh, I would make an argument, Ryan, for another emotional episode that probably doesn't give enough credit is the episode where Bender finds out that he doesn't have a backup drive. And so if he dies, he dies. And so he and Hermes go to track down the inspector that passed Bender while he was defective. (laughs) And when you find out that Hermes is the one who, in fact, was the person who approved him, because if he didn't approve him, Bender would have been tossed in the trash there it's it's not the same as a jurassic bark or a luck of the fryish or uh but it it does have something there's something very touching about that whole element of like they take these side characters of bender and hermes and put them together in a story that you wouldn't think those two would be good on their own story together and it ends up coming out with something quite heartwarming um it's like kind of the miracle of that show is they can put two characters together that don't necessarily belong and make something beautiful out of it. And like one of the episodes I was just watching before recording was um, Zoidberg and Farnsworth and their history together prior to the events of the series thus far and how Zoidberg promised to kill Farnsworth because of the malarial plague that he got when they were both on their first like mission together for mom Corps. Uh, and again, the, the show just works a lot of miracles. So if you haven't watched Futurama guys, find a way to watch it. DVD, Hulu, doesn't matter. Um, so yeah. And that's all I watched this week. 
It's a great show. One of my oh, favorites. Yeah. And and the animation, I love how the animation um, they took more chances in the Comedy Central years with the animation because like the three D stuff still looks great, and it's just like it feels like they were able to get trippier than they would have at Fox. Like they they're able to go some, to some like really intriguing places with it. Like they have that one where the they they go through like a portal and whatnot. And there's like telescope vision, and you have all those benders. Uh, doing a conga line going bender 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 and it's like a, a sequence that lasts probably five seconds longer than it would have if it had been done at fox <laughs> um so yeah wonderful show uh yeah i just watched a couple things um i finished the uh horror trilogy from netflix uh fear street um this one goes back to 1666 and uh, kind of details the origin of the horrors taking place in this uh, town, which is really cool about uh, the final part is it does wrap up the story. It doesn't leave you on a cliffhanger. So if you watch all three of them, you do get a complete story. And they're uh, totally, this one is a lot different. It was more of a satanic panic film opposed to a slasher movie, which the other two are. Um, my favorite part is part two because I am partial to Friday the 13th and it's a great homage to Friday the 13th. Um, but they all are really, really violent and really well done. And you can, I mean, you'll see this, the twist coming, but it's still a pretty fun ride. So if you like horror films and you want to watch six hours of blood and guts, um, yeah, fear street on, Netflix is not a bad way to go. Uh, I also watched on uh, Netflix uh, Gunpowder Milkshake, which is uh, Karen Gillian's. Um, oh, yeah, I saw the previews for that. Is it any good? Uh, it's all right. Um, it's kind of like John Wick, um, where it's he's an assassin or a hit person. And at the beginning of the movie she kills a bunch of people and one of them happens to be the son of some mob boss and then it kind of goes from there where she's on the run from them um you know i I mentioned earlier about how netflix kind of um by putting movies out sometimes it's just there and it feels like watching this film that it has lots of style but it, I don't know. It gets lost in translation when it just goes to streaming, if that makes any sense at all. Um, there's this moment at the like end. Like you think it would have been better on the big screen? Yeah, because it loses some of its oomph. Um, uh, there's a, a moment at the end where it's this really cool um, slow motion tracking shot with, uh, a, I'm not going to, I won't spoil who's all in the movie, but there's some pretty really cool actresses in it. And it's them just mowing down a bunch of bad guys. And it's pretty violent and pretty awesome. But it seems like it's not as impactful as it should have been. Uh, And I don't know. There's this quality to a lot of Netflix movies, too, where it's um, the pacing of them seems a little off because they're not really tied to anybody overseeing them. Uh, where they can kind of just tell their story. And I, I think that's still the problem with Justice uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League is what happens when you give him everything he wants. You get a bloated, overly complicated, not well-developed four-hour superhero film with some really cool moments in it. <laughs> and that's how I feel about uh, Gunpowder Milkshake. Um, it looks cool. Um Karen Gillian's awesome in it. Um, There's some cool music in it. But again, it just seems really disposable where it's another movie where it's like, hey, this is on Netflix and it has really cool actresses in it. And it'd be sweet if there's a, you know, a female version of John Wick that's kind of candy coated and neon ish. Um, And there's some parts that don't make any sense. Uh, there's these dudes that show up to take care of all these assassin girls or hit 
ladies, I don't know what you want to call them. And 90% of them have hammers and bats and knives while these girls have guns. And if you're going to go take out a hit person, why would you show up with a bunch of knives and hammers? Some of the things just doesn't make sense. I mean, it looks cool. It looks cinematic, but that's about it. <laughs> you think I would like it? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's entertaining. It's an entertaining movie. Um, but I, like I said, I just think something's lost in the streaming platform. Um, I felt the same thing about uh, The Tomorrow War, which was supposed to come out in theaters. But um, when a movie is kind of stupid, um, where the writing isn't really the best or the characters aren't really well developed, if you don't have like the big flashy moments in it that you get on the big screen, you lose kind of some of the um, impact of the film. And yeah, and that's all I watched this week. So I just wanted to, since you brought up Netflix, I wanted to amend my earlier statement and that there is supposed to be a Virgin River season four. It hasn't been confirmed by Netflix, but I guess the main actress has said that she will be coming back for season four. So it sounds like it's expected, but maybe not quite confirmed yet. Yep, we'll see. Hopefully Netflix will do it. Who knows? <laughs> um, they're weird. I mean, uh, Stranger Things is getting a season four, right? Yeah, that's because it's a cult- uh, like it's culturally relevant. It's transcended Netflix. Right. Um, I mean, I would say Virgin River probably cost them a lot less money to make than Stranger Things. Yeah, but I mean... Stranger Things is something where they can still point to and get people to subscribe. What you're telling me, I've never even heard of the show. So, Right. Well, but then again, I don't think it's a show you would really seek out. And it's uh, probably I would not. not. <laughs> it's not one that the Netflix algorithm is going to recommend to you unless it's on Laura's account. Which, yeah, Laura might like it. Yep. Maybe. <laughs> um, this week on Real Nerds Podcast, we saw Space Jam, A New Legacy. Brad, would you recommend people seeing Space Jam? Uh, I don't know. I didn't hate it, uh, but it is really noisy and bombastic, and uh, the rules don't make sense. But they don't have to. It's just um, it just makes me feel old watching it because it's 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 just <laughs> nonstop. It's just relentlessly uh, bombarding you with humor and colors and noise and. Uh, but at the same time, it, I actually thought the story was better developed than the original. Um, I, I actually bought LeBron James as a, as a decent lead actor in it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's fun. It's just, you know, it's a lot of uh, sacker. It's just a sugary candy for the senses. Karen, do you recommend Space Jam? I do. I uh, went and saw it on Saturday in the theater, and then I went to a party after, and I mentioned it to some people, like, oh, yeah, I went to see Space Jam, and I liked it. And they're like, wow, you liked it? I was like, yeah, like, maybe we should all go see it tomorrow, and then we didn't. We ended up doing something else, but, you know, I was telling people, like, you should check it out. You should give it a chance, and I, from what I've heard of the people who have seen it in my friend circle, it seems to be kind of you know, divisive. Like maybe some people were like, "Hey, it was fine," and then other people were like, "Oh no, it was terrible." So, I guess I fall on the. I really liked it. I wanted to go see it again in the theater, uh, and I probably will at some point. Um, and then I was rewatching clips on HBO Max today, and I thought it was a really cute movie. It's kind of got the same like zany energy of the first one, but it's definitely um, got a lot more like plot and like character development to it. And sometimes, like, it does um, do a lot of, like, self filating with, like, the whole HBO and Warner Brothers stuff. Um, but it, honestly, I think once they started playing basketball, I was like, okay, this is a good movie. <laughs> but you kind of have to get through a lot to get to that point. Zach? Because... I was, I don't know how to recommend this film because 
I don't hate the first Space Jam, but this one kind of left me pretty cold. Um, so I guess I don't recommend it, but I will talk about it in the after the trailer. But I was in in the theater where there were a bunch of families in the audience and I heard the kids laughing at the Looney Tune antics. And that gives me hope that it will it will make new Looney Tunes fans in the process the way the first Space Jam did. Um, but there's issues I have with this film for any bright spots that are in it. So I'm kind of at a weird 50% on this where I'm like, there's a merit to this in certain respects. And then there's a lot where I just find it absolutely um, wrongheaded of Warner brothers to do certain things that they do in this film. Um, But I will just say this, if you're looking for a Looney Tunes movie that still absolutely captures what the Looney Tunes are technically supposed to be, they made that in 2003. It's called Looney Tunes Back in Action. This is a this is a Space Jam movie. It's unabashedly a Space Jam movie. And if the job was to capture the the fever of that first film, I think technically they succeeded. But like I said, we'll get into it after the review. But I don't know if I can fully recommend the film, to be honest. Um, I don't know if this or Fast 9 is my least favorite film of the year. <laughs> um, but it's close. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I just, it's not funny. It's not well acted. I mean, Don Cheadle's pretty good in it. The, uh, I'd actually push back on the Looney Tunes stuff. I don't think it's a well representation of Looney Tunes. One, because Bugs Bunny says Doc way too much in it. Like, mm-hmm. he says, it, like, Rick says Morty and Rick and Morty. Um, yeah. And it, it kind of grated on me. Um, I, I didn't like the character of Daffy in it. I don't think he was zany enough. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I don't think LeBron James is a good actor. I he basically had one emotion in this. I just I could not get into this movie at all. Um, I never laughed. Uh, actually, I laughed at one little bit. Um, Marvin the Martian shows up for some reason, um, and he's going through his ray gun, and there's a part where it says Charles Ray. It's yeah, really that, funny. that was funny. That was a funny side gag. That's the best joke in the film the rest of it is just garbage and it has nothing to do with looney tunes or Mm -hmm. uh anything it's we're gonna pump up lebron james because even they have this like hype thing about everything lebron james has done yeah and then it's it's similar to what they did with michael jordan in the first space jam i know it's just it's to me that's not a movie it's just oh look at yeah he's a great basketball player and they even mention it uh, when they're playing the basketball game, it says he plays the best low post of anybody in the history of the game. And it kept on feeling to me they w- they had to put this stuff in to get LeBron James on board. And they had a bunch of like uh, LeBron James product placement through it. Oh, it drove me crazy. Here's the trailer for uh, a new legacy. Basketball camp is next weekend. You got amazing potential on the court and I can help you get there. That's not what I want, Dad. You never let me do what I want to do. You never let me just do me. Hold up. Wrong floor. I bet Will Smith ain't got to deal with this. Dad! Down! What in the Matrix hell? Welcome to the space. Welcome, King James. I am the king of this domain. This is the serververse. What'd you do to my son? Where's Dom? The only way you're getting your son back is if you and I play a little basketball. Pete, send this clown to the rejects. Wait. What is this? I'm a cartoon? Meep. What's up, Doc? Come on and ride, baby, ride! I need to assemble an elite team to help give my son back. I know what you're looking for. So shoot, baby, shoot! A dream team. Mom, shoot the ball! Let's try that again, shall we? King James. Welcome to the Space Jam. Introducing.
Introducing the Goon Squad! This game. Let's end this. Got you, Kron? And get our son back. Oh! Yikes. <laughs> Classic. Welcome to the space camp. Whoa. Welcome to the Space Jam. Uh, Space Jam, a new legacy. Uh, in it, LeBron James is a kid, and he's playing a Game Boy when he should be focusing on basketball. And his coach is like, you're an asshole. You need to be paid, paying attention to basketball. And then that's all he cares about. So now he's an asshole to his kids. But his kid wants to develop a video game. But he wants his kids to play basketball. And in the process, he makes fun of Don Cheadle's algorithm program which makes Don Cheadle mad and then they're sucked into the servers at Warner Brothers and they have to play a basketball game that his son developed but he didn't listen to his son so he doesn't know how to play the game so they're getting destroyed and that's the plot of Space Jam so so Ryan I'm amazed <laughs> that you described that plot and didn't have uh, an aneurysm right afterward <laughs> um, so bad the first of all like let's get this right off the bat the movie is called Space Jam A New Legacy so the new legacy is that it, a, a Space Jam movie that doesn't have anything to do with elements of outer space. Okay, uh, fine. I'll deal with that. <laughs> um, it's not like it mattered in the it's first one to begin with. Anyway. Okay, fine. Fair enough. <laughs> I was gonna well say, played, Dave. Brad. Well yeah. played. Okay. See, <laughs> they yeah. do use hey. the spaceship to fly around to the different worlds. I okay. That's also fair. And I Brad, sit- you should be working for Warner Brothers. So. I was sitting there during the movie going to be like, I guess it's space because of cyberspace. So... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that was able to calm your brain down for yeah. more than five minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll be clear, Ryan, when I, the, uh, my, my, my impression of how they handle the Looney Tunes here is not positive. Uh, the positive element that I found was that it was fun listening to hear families and other folks enjoying the antics that they were presenting. But as somebody who like you has spent a lot of time with those, Warner Brothers shorts, it's hard for me to separate out what Looney Tunes is supposed to be versus what the Space Jam version of Looney Tunes has always been since that first movie in 96. And they didn't really do much to uh, adjust the errors in the first one in regards to how the Looney Tunes are portrayed. The one thing that they do that I appreciated the attempt, even though they don't succeed, is allowing Looney Tunes to be Looney Tunes in the middle of this game because there are a lot of times in that first movie where they are trying to adhere to basketball uh, basketball tactics. And in this one, like the lesson learned is you've got to let the Looney Tunes be the Looney Tunes and absolutely fuck with the court. Um, but the Daffy Duck's low-level portrayal in this piece was disappointing to say the very least. <laughs> Like, how do you just relegate him to the coach role? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, he needs to be on that court w- with the rest of them yucking it up. And it's... Yeah, done. and uh, too, uh, uh, I also... This is just me being get off my lawn guy. But I also don't like that when LeBron James goes into Toon World or whatever the fuck it's called, and he says, Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck... Marvin the Martian, like he's introducing them to people like we're too stupid to know who they are. I mean, I, I, everybody knows who they are. It's not, they, they did it in Mortal Kombat, but no one knows who Cabal is in Mortal Kombat. I get that. Yeah, um, no, that was helpful for somebody like me with Mortal Kombat. <laughs> with this, but I don't know. It's just, uh, it's just hard for me to, I don't know. Just so much of this movie irritated me. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> this is, me too. I, I really dislike annoying extras in movies. I don't know if I'm the only one, but the extras during the basketball game, they were always pumping their fists and doing shit when there was no sound coming out of them. Mm-hmm. And the dude who was supposed to be Mr. Freeze, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze, drove me fucking insane. <laughs> he was always behind Don Cheadle. And oh, it was driving me fucking crazy. Um, who, 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 I mean, like, I'm not like, I'm not 
I will not diss the the quote unquote like I, the direction of this film is ten times better than the first Space Jam in terms of the visual and technical acumen. Oh um, no, I mean I, it, it looks amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's well, no, I'm not you knocking are, the look of the film, but you are right. Those extras. I was going to point out who who is making a PG movie and decides, you know what we need? The Droogies from A Clockwork Orange. That's what well, we need in the, the background. the same thing, Zach. I was like, why and, are and they here? In the background, I'm like, what the hell? That is, <laughs> now, but that, but then again, you could also be asking, okay, well, then why is there a Pulp Fiction joke in the first Space Jam? And I guess That's technically, true. I don't, I, I have no reason to disregard that. It was just strange to see it, but it's, I guess, no more strange than granny drinking martinis and saying haters going to hate. I guess it's just, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. The Looney Tunes have always referenced pop culture of all variants, whether family entertainment or adult entertainment. So it's not like this is out of the norm, but I, my understanding is that um, with the adult <laughs> characters in there, it is weird, but I think it was an excuse to renew copyrights for some That's of those fair. things. That's totally fair. So like they that... literally use that as a, as a tool to, it makes sense for a lot of how they handle this film. <laughs> um, can we talk about the, uh, the, the, the amount of times Warner Brothers tries to own their own mistakes with IP by addressing their business decisions with this algorithm joke? Because I find it very, uh, I find it very uh, uh, terrible of Warner Brothers to poke fun at their own selves for the terrible business decisions that they, they have made over the last five years in a way that doesn't uh, that is not justified because they it's almost just like no 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 you you you've made terrible decisions that have like damaged careers and so like you making owning a joke about it in space jam 2 seems super disingenuous to me <laughs> um and not hey, to Corinne, mention, yeah. you liked the movie what did you like about it <laughs> I, I mean it was just kind of fun to see all those characters again on screen i liked the sequence where they were going around and collecting all the tunes i really like mm -hmm. who was it um who are the ones who were in Mad Max? It was like Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote or something. Yeah, it was Roadrunner, Wiley e. Coyote, and... which I thought later I was like, Tasmanian Devil should have been there. Like, you know, Australia. There's that, that connection. That does make the most sense. Yeah, but um, I don't know. It was just, it was just fun. It. I wasn't. I guess I didn't have like super high expectations for it. It's a Space Jam movie. Like the first Space Jam was absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's a commercial, and, and this is a commercial as well. I mean, I know you guys are, more, you know, I just have a kind of a peripheral knowledge of Looney Tunes. Like, I watched them a little when I was a kid, and I watched Space Jam a lot when I was a kid. So I'm not, like, I guess so well-versed in the Looney Tunes lore as you are, but I felt like they got the Looney Tunes right, that they were just loony, and the whole sequence of, like, Wile E. Coyote and duplicating the balls and you know, they're just kind of wacky. I felt like it had like a good energy to it and seeing the different animation styles, like, you know, they're, a good chunk of this movie is in the 2D animation. And then when they switch to 3D, it's really, really impressive mm -hmm. because they- I do like they that they, I do like that they point out that it's like, that, that's not what they want to be. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> they, they made it cartoonish enough that they don't look like super photorealistic, but they still mesh really well with like the environment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's a testament to the animators. And like, there are gags in this movie that are fun. Like the movie yeah. isn't devoid. I didn't mean to cut you off, Zach. I was just, we were just like, negative 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 is driving me crazy <laughs> no i understand totally <laughs> nothing fine. you personally it's just uh i will say i i did give the film one and a half stars the one star is for the ray charles joke and uh the half star is that they let bugs bunny be the hero and i liked that mm -hmm. um i will make an argument for that porky pig rap being a lot of fun no it's it, awful. ryan ryan awful kids are going to get a history lesson of how long porky pig has been around and basically founded the looney tunes starting in 1935 he works that into the lyrics i'm a fan of that i like the i like that <laughs> sure. idea um what well, i wasn't a fan of that sequence in oh, particular was, 
I did. So there's two sequences I really liked, and I went back and rewatched clips of them. Was when they introduced Kronos with uh, Dame Time, uh, and like the song that plays, the slow motion, like everything just kind of clicked in that sequence for me, and it was just like really impressive, and like I said, it had really good energy. And then when they introduced Michael Jordan. <laughs> Uh, no, was, that was that like, was funny like they when they said it i was like oh my gosh like he's really gonna do a cameo and then they kind of built it up a little too much and i was like no it's not really gonna be him but then of course it's michael b jordan and i was like okay like boom the light bulbs went off i'm like all oh, right this brian coogler was a producer so that makes a lot of sense and i like there's a there's a gag on uh, uh, my daffy's. eyes rolled when that happened I go, there, oh, okay. there's a there's a <laughs> gag on daffy's um notepad um yeah, where it says like it's trade Sylvester. Trade something. Sylvester. <laughs> that did give me a good chuckle. Um, and I do like the ball duplicating gag with Wiley e. Coyote because it's 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 kind of nice to see like oh cool one of his Acme inventions is finally going to work and then of course it doesn't but it's like it comes well, like this. Also, Wiley, I think he, Wiley the, Coyote got the most points out of anybody. He, he did. I think he got like what like five hundred in that one play. He's the reason they won the game really. What? Why did the goon squad not score a single point in the whole second half? The fuck? Because they were allowed until to until the very it's... end when Don Cheadle like dunked the ball. Because the Looney Tunes were allowed to be Looney because they weren't being dictated by LeBron James's typical basketball standards. Instead, they were allowed to be Looney Tunes, which is what they are. So I guess that's why. It's also a movie, so I'm not going to expect it to run by the same rules that a normal basketball game does. <laughs> no, I don't I care mean, about that. Just I'm go just... back and watch the original Space Jam. They do that kind of bullshit too. I'm not. I just. It just drives me crazy. The extras, Brad. You've been quiet. Is there anything we missed that you wanted to bring up? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about the extras too, and I kind of came down on the side of like, well, you can't really move them because then it would just be like continuity error after continuity error. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I don't um, care about that. It's just they're acting. Oh, it drove me crazy. But uh, going back to like, I appreciated Bugs Bunny sacrificing himself, but it is negated by the fact that by the end of the movie, he's just like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> like, here I am. True. But I mean, I, it kind of made sense though because we don't know how it. What? I, I was like in the middle of a thought. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, well, like I, when they were kind of coming up with the play, um, I was like, why don't they just, if, if if LeBron James is such a basketball mastermind, why doesn't he use his knowledge to trick Al G Rhythm into performing that glitch himself so that he's the one who gets deleted from the game? It actually would make more sense from a Looney Tunes point of view to have Bugs Bunny trick him the same way he tricks like Elmer Fudd or any of his other uh, nemeses in the different shorts, it would make more sense. Yeah, but like my feeling is like the Looney Tunes are still cameo actors in this movie, and the core of the story mm-hmm. is LeBron James and his son. Mm-hmm. So, you know, LeBron James finally caves and starts, um, you know, letting people have fun, but then he can still be the hero by being like, okay, I know about basketball. I can goad uh, uh this guy into performing the move so we don't have to sacrifice ourselves after all Mm -hmm. like it doesn't have to be one of us um or the kid's so smart that he can do it so i guess it's i guess it's to give bugs bunny emotional stakes which he doesn't technically have in the first space jam apart from the whole slavery thing but but he doesn't have in the end because you know he doesn't sacrifice himself he's just like surprise i'm i'm okay i'm just in the real world whatever there's no explanation. It just is because it has to be a happy ending. Yeah, I well, mean, they're I... Looney Tunes. They're indestructible. How many times has Wiley e. Coyote like fallen off a cliff or whatever? That's yeah. just so why, so how why should I operate. care if Bug sacrifices himself? Then, yeah, you're right because because, that, because everybody else does. But oh but again, but again, the issue, Corinne, is is that if he dies, then and we know he can come back because again, he is a cartoon character and he is a Looney Tune then the emotional moment of him glitching away is literally tossed in the garbage by that point. So it's like almost like, why have it? Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. It's just like, oh, he was going to make it anyway, so he's not really making a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's Space Jam. Did you really think somebody was going to actually die? No, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I was just saying, like, you could, you could save your just uh, random ending by not sacrificing bugs like lebron and his son could just defeat him himself um you know and not have to find an explanation of why he came back or just saying like he just came back and there's no need for one and we're just gonna end the movie 
But I will say though that it, maybe it lends to the fact that, like Ryan, you said that you enjoyed that Bugs Bunny was the hero in the movie. Yeah, so, I mean, at least they gave them that in a movie that's supposed to be about the Looney Tunes as well. Um, yeah. And to, uh, I'll say one last thing that irked me, and then I'm done. Um, I don't like that Ingrid Bergman was in this film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but uh, like, because they're. I mean, I get. I, I guess you gotta hit those four be... quadrant properties, Ryan. <laughs> I know, right? The forty-five to eighty-seven demographic. I don't know, too. And I just, you know, I, I get. Is it supposed to be funny that LeBron James is upset that he's Robin? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just. I guess I'm just a stay off my lawn kind of person. But it just to me, you know, putting. I, I get why Yosemite Sam is there. But it also because his name's Sam, but it doesn't make any sense why he would be in Casablanca. And well, um, have you see, well, well, he was technically in Carrot Blanco when they did that short. He plays the um, the Strasser equivalent in Carrot Blanca. Yeah, but, but why is he playing the Sam part? In- <laughs> just because his name is Sam. That's I, mean, I agree with you. It's it's stupid <laughs> because they just did it because his name is Sam. It's it doesn't make much sense. And that they have that film. I will say though, uh, it's nice to see Ingrid Bergman that big again. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, 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 I like- don't know. I like the line, me. "Lady, you've got baggage," but <laughs> it's it's like almost like why not just reanimate your setting from Carat Blanca as opposed to just inserting the Looney Tunes into previously established well, footage from Casablanca. Well, because people know what Casablanca is. They don't know what Carat Blanca is. I'll... I mean, it's it's a parody of Casablanca. It's not going to be. No, I know, but done. we get that joke, Zach. Uh, the, I, I... Yeah, I've the never heard it, Carat Blanca or whatever. Mm. Okay, well, at any rate, uh, I agree, Ryan. I don't appreciate ingrid bergman being utilized in this film either because that is i i it's not like an insult to casablanca and it doesn't take anything away from me it's just kind of just like why why not just make it black and like a black and white like a generic black and white world that has a detective character and whatnot like but i guess it doesn't fall in line with the rest of the references they make whether it's the dc universe or harry potter or the matrix however they want to insert warner brothers references like the the attempts to try to do that are attempting to be like fun tongue-in-cheek but they come off as just just as disingenuous as the advertisements do uh in the form of the first space jam so uh one of my um friends on facebook we met him at telluride horror he's a filmmaker his name's uh rafael he uh he said space jam new legacy more like ready player no i'm like yeah yeah, that's more clever than anything in Space Jam. <laughs> that's uh, so a Warner that's, Brothers movie. Yeah, that's the thing. Like the Warner Brothers has done this twice now, where they've inserted the Iron Giant into properties other than the Iron Giant. And but Ready Player One is fun. And, Space Jam and, is not, and that makes sense because that's what's written in the book. The book is, from what I understand, the book is referencing those those things directly. Space Jam is conjuring this up with four to five writers to basically say let's. Let's throw all the Warner Brothers things we can into this jumbled mix of a movie, which, okay, that's fine, but it just it, that doesn't mean it's going to work. I did appreciate in DC World that they uh, attempted to capture certain elements of the animation style from those DC shows. Mm-hmm. Like, I really like cool that sequence. See. That was fun. And I did like the idea of Daffy Duck setting up his own superhero videos. <laughs> that actually was kind of funny he's just like i'll save him like oh no 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 like superman's gonna kill me like i better deflect the blame to the pig (laughs) yep yeah um next week i don't know what do we see next week brad snake eyes i think which one snake Snake eyes Eyes. oh snake Snake eyes Eyes. right i'll see any movie with henry golding it oh my gosh viacom's paramount's snake eyes gi joe origins colon harry golding i guess old is also out but like i think i'm done with Shyamalan's chick yeah i'd rather see snake eyes or pig with nicholas cage do you want to yeah, see nicholas see guys okay fair enough <laughs> I wanna you, don't wanna, you don't want to <laughs> see nicholas cage hunt down people who took his pig yeah I, you can watch it. it doesn't have to be the movie of the week though yeah i mean i i don't know i, I want to see a fun movie <laughs>
and hopefully Snake Eyes is fun. I mean, the trailers look really fun. Yeah. I mean, it's got Harry Henry Golding in it. It's going to be fun for some yeah, it's, people. It's like ninjas and shit. Yeah. Between cool. this and Shang Chi, I'm just like, what is going on with all this like ninja stuff? I don't even uh, think is it Shang Chi supposed to be like kung fu? I don't even know. Uh, he is the master of kung fu. Yes. Okay, but then Snake Eyes is Japanese, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to find out. And G.I. Joe Origins presents the Snake Eyes story. When are we going to get Cobra Commander's origin story where they bring back Joseph Gordon-Levitt? <laughs> We're just not going to get that, are we, Ryan? We're not nope. going to get it. <laughs> I don't even know anything about G.I. Joe, but Henry Golding's in it, so I'm going to go see it. Well, uh, they're the Wednesday real American man. hero. Well, Corinne, when, when you uh, when you learn enough about them, then you'll be able to say, "Now I know," and knowing was half that battle. Is Snake Eyes a villain? Like I don't even know. No, he's on their side, I believe. Uh, I don't know. Who cares? Maybe he looks cool. Here's the villain origin story. Julie, it, 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 look, Corinne, he's designed to sell toys. That's that's the that's the premise. It's no different than a transformer. It, it's designed to sell you a toy. Do you want to buy the Snake Eyes toy? No. Okay, then it didn't work for you. You're not hitting their quadrant. Anyways, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Real Nerds Podcast. Real Nerds Podcast is a production of Nebulous Visions Multimedia. Thank you to Sparks Mandrill and Plan 9 Studios for our kick-ass theme song. Also, if you're in the Denver area and you're looking for a cool place to see movies, we see them at the Alamo Draft House in Littleton and now also in Sloan's Lake. Thank you to Colorado Coins, Cards, and Comics for supplying us with all our comic needs, especially you, Andrew. You know who you are. And a big shout-out to James's mom. I'm giving you an electronic hug that you can feel through the airwaves. Thanks for listening, and have a nice day. What a dickhead.